Hello, welcome to Free Bible Commentary with Pastor Teacher Dr. Bob Utley. Be sure to visit Free Bible Commentary at www.freebiblecommentary.org. Now, here's Bob. We're going to start in chapters 3 and 4, and this will be looking at the beginning of the official acts of Solomon that run through chapter 11, with a summary at the very close of chapter 11. Not a very pleasant summary, I'm afraid. Now, in chapter 3, we had then Solomon formed a marriage reliance with Pharaoh, king of Egypt. Notice it wasn't really with, for, it wasn't because of, of a love thing, it was because of a political thing. Now, we know that uh, Egypt historically had resisted this kind of thing. Somewhat surprising that Egypt uh, would agree to this. Many think that this was during the latter stages of the 21st dynasty when Egypt was so weak, and this would assure Solomon's southern border and the trade routes thereof. And so, many think that's what it was about. This, is, this uh, in its expanded form, is going to be what causes Solomon's downfall later, these foreign wives. You all see chapter 11, verses 4 through 6. But this, this marriage is never condemned. The Bible nowhere condemns the marriage to Egyptian women, uh, just to Canaanite women, the tribes of Canaan, Deuteronomy 7, 3. Uh, because there's never any mention of uh, Egyptian gods being worshipped, uh, the rabbis say this lady became a proselyte. And that may well be true. Now, notice it says, And he took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her to the city of David. Now, there's going to be kind of a, a descriptive phrase that follows. Why would he bring her to the city of David, which is a, a holy place because the ark has been there? Well, basically, uh, it's talked about that he built her a palace outside the walls later in chapter 9, verse 24. And the explanation, much like is found here, is also found in Second Chronicles chapter 8, verse 11. Uh, it's really important when you study Kings to find the parallel in Chronicles and compare it. It's, it's kind of helpful like comparing the Synoptic Gospels. Uh, and so it'll be helpful to find the parallel to this chapter. And of course the parallel for this chapter is Second Chronicles chapter 1 verses 2 through 13. Uh, and notice that he's going to build some other projects. He's going to build the house of the Lord, uh, the wall around Jerusalem. Uh, Josephus basically says is he added to the wall of David, particularly to the north. Uh, we know the temple was to the north of the old Jebusite city. Uh, it's interesting, I think, that the Septuagint, the Greek translation, in chapter 12 of, of, of 1 Kings, says that Jeroboam I, who in 922, after Solomon dies and his son Rehoboam uh, comes on the scene, uh, will split the kingdom. This, this Jeroboam I, who may have helped build this wall, was the guy who worked with the forced labor from the uh, tribal uh, tribe of Ephraim. And uh, we'll, we'll see him later, of course. The people were still sacrificing on high places because there was no house built for the name of the Lord in those days. And this idea about the high places and this special place that God calls his name to dwell, one should consult Deuteronomy chapter 12. Literally the whole chapter talks about it, but particularly Deuteronomy 12 verses 3, verse 5, verse 8, and verse 13 and 14 deal with the negation of the high places and an emphasis on one central sanctuary. Now at this period, the high places, and this is the problem, the word meant uh, just a, a like a, a not necessarily geographical because some are located in valleys, but a low rising hill or even a artificial thing of where the Canaanites practiced their religion. Now it seems that the problem was that this worshiping in the same place uh, helped them to kind of get into a synchristic kind of thing um, that was dangerous, and that's why it's condemned. I think it negates the central sanctuary. It tended to lend toward Canaanite worship. Now in verse 3 it mentions, And now Solomon loved the Lord. Now here, it's a very uh, wonderful affirmation of his faith. Walking the statutes of his father David. Of course, walking is the ideal of keeping the commandments on a lifestyle basis. Except he sacrificed the burnt incense on the high places. Now this, uh, this is the idea of the, uh, let's see, smoke arose. He, he, he burned incense. Uh, some say this is just showing that Solomon was a very religious man. As he walked in the way of the Lord, he burned incense. But the word accepts the problem, and it does seem to have this ambiguous relationship that, uh, that these high places are later condemned, and even in Deuteronomy are condemned. Um, so it, it's a strange relationship here. The central sanctuary had moved several places. First it was in Gilgal, then it was in Shechem, then it was in Shiloh, then it was in Bethel, and uh, now finally it will come to reside in Jerusalem, of course, when the temple is built there. Um, and, the, and the king went to Gibeon. 
We learn from the parallel in Second Chronicles chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, that he took almost all of the leaders of Israel with him this time. As you know, Gibeon was the place where the tabernacle, or at least the remains of it, though there's no record in the Old Testament, there's an allusion in Jeremiah to the fact that the sanctuary at Shiloh, where Eli was, was destroyed by the Philistines. Whatever was left of that tabernacle, whether the brazen altar or laver or whatever, was taken to Gibeon. Now, the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem uh, by David, and, we, and uh, let's see, you might want to see Second Chronicles 1, 3 through 6 to confirm that. Um, okay. Uh, to sacrifice there. Now, Gibeon, of course, remember Joshua 9. These are the ones, the Canaanites, that tricked Joshua uh, into making a deal with them as if they had been traveling a long way. Uh, for there was the great high place. Solomon offered a thousand bird offerings on the altar. Um, Josephus says that uh, this Gibeon was really Hebron, but I think that's not true. A thousand bird offerings seems somewhat elaborate, but for an inauguration like this, I, I don't think it is in its own day. In Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon. Now, Gibeon's about six miles northwest in a dream. That's very common. God did that very often in the Old Testament. And God said, Ask what you wish me to give you. I think God's testing Solomon's priorities. And Solomon uh, basically said two things. Uh, Thou hast shown great loving kindness to thy, thy servant David, my father. This word loving kindness is a very beautiful word. It's the Hebrew word hesed. It means God's covenant loyalty that God had been faithful to all that he had promised David. And so Solomon says, according as he walked before thee. Notice there was a conditional element. In truth, and this, this word means truthfulness, faithfulness really, and righteousness and uprightness of heart toward thee. The heart was said to be the center of the personality. And thou hast reserved for him this great loving kindness, covenant faithfulness, uh, that thou hast given him uh, a son to sit on the throne. Now, as I said, Josephus thinks he's 14 uh, most modern scholars would say he's around 20 years old. Verse 7. So now, O Lord, now this, look, it's all caps. It's the covenant name for God, Yahweh. My God, capital G, Elohim, thou hast made thy servant king. Now, the word servant's a very honorific title. Uh, used for um, Moses, used for so uh, Joshua after his death, used for David. And uh, here it's, it, Solomon takes it for himself. In place of my father David. Yet I am but a little child. Now, some think that means age. Some think it's an act of humility. Uh, we're not real sure. I do not ha know how to go out and come in. Now, some say that talks about lifestyle manners. Uh, but really, other places that's used, it seems to talk about, I don't know how to administer this people. I don't know how to govern them. It seems to be a possible fulfillment to Numbers 27:17 that God would provide adequate administrators. It, this little phrase is used several times. You might want to look up Deuteronomy 28:6, Deuteronomy 31:1. 1 Samuel 18.13 and 2 Samuel 3.25 for some other uses of this, go out and come in. Notice where it says that thy servant uh, and thy servant is in the midst of thy people which thou hast chosen. It's a very significant phrase that thou hast chosen. It goes back to the call of Abraham in Genesis 12, 1 through 3, that God picked Abraham to pick a nation, to pick a world, because we learn from Exodus 19.5 and 6, he did choose the Jews but he chose them as an instrumentality to reach all the world because all the world belonged to him. And the same thing is affirmed also in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 6 through 9. The chosenness of the Jews in the Old Testament was for service, not for some kind of special loving relationship. That's important we see that. A, a, a great people who cannot be numbered or counted for a, for a multitude. Now this, of course, is an allusion to, to uh, aspects and phraseology of the Abrahamic covenant. Particularly, you might want to see Genesis 13:16, Genesis 15:5, and Genesis 22:17. It's a direct allusion to that. So, in verse 9, Solomon asks for this very famous thing: "So give thy servant an understanding heart to judge." Now, literally, it means a listening heart. Now, it reminds me a whole lot of James 1:5, where to ask for wisdom. That's what Solomon did: to judge thy people, to discern between good and evil. Uh, who is able to judge this great people of thine? Well, that was tremendous. And verse 10 says God was pleased with that because it wasn't a selfish prayer. It was, it was, a, it was a, a prayer for God's glory uh, through Solomon uh, leading God's people. And God was pleased. And he says because you haven't asked for long life or riches or, or victory in battle, which most people would have asked for, uh, God's going to give him all of those things. And notice that he's going to make him wiser than anyone. And you might want to see Matthew 12, verse 42, and Luke 11, verse uh, 31, until Jesus, of course. And I have also given you what you have not asked for, both riches and honor. The word riches comes from the same root as the word glory. It means something that's heavy or weighty. It's an interesting word. 
Um, notice the conditional element in verse uh, 14. Well, before I go there, look at verse 13. So that there will be, not be any among, among the kings like you all of your days. That's very interesting to me uh, in this sense. It shows that even this tremendous gift of wisdom. Now, wisdom in the Old Testament, there's, there's a difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge is more facts. Wisdom is more, more practical, harsh sense. In this case, wisdom to judge. Uh, but this gift from God was not enough. For we know with all of Solomon's wisdom and all of his reputation, at the end of his life, he failed God. Isn't that sad? That you can be extremely gifted, and it, but still somehow lose the fellowship of the Lord. Yes, I think that the Bible talks about that God gives spiritual gifts. And once given, they want, they're not taken back. But unless we match the gifts of God with God's attitude, God's worship, God, a reverence for God, a walk of faith, uh, the gifts are useless in maintaining our relationship with God. I think it's very important that we see that. Here is a very, very gifted man. Uh, but a man later in his life blew it very, very badly. Notice in verse 14 is the conditional element. If you walk. Now the word walk is a very beautiful Hebrew word. Remember the old vacation Bible school verse? Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The idea of walk was that, that God's given us clearly defined boundaries. Uh, like a, a, the pathway, a road or an animal trek. Uh, we, we can follow it clearly because it's plain to see. And if we'll walk in God's ways, then all the blessings of Deuteronomy 27 and 28 will be ours. But if we violate it on a corporate level or an individual level, we reap the consequences and we see that Solomon did violate it. Look at chapter 11, verses 11 through 14. Um, notice in verse 15, Then Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. And he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant. Notice he came to Jerusalem. The Ark was in Jerusalem. The remaining part of whatever was left of the tabernacle was in Gibeon. Um, the ark of the covenant of the Lord and offered burnt offerings and made peace offerings and he made a feast for all his servants now the meat from the peace offerings would be available to eat with Solomon and his friends and courtiers and administrators there uh, in Jerusalem and that's the idea it was a free will offering now verses 16 through 28 the end of this chapter is a story about two prostitutes the rabbis have always been nervous about uh, two prostitutes coming to see the king uh, they have said they were innkeepers. They have, uh, some commentators say they're Jebusite prostitutes, not Hebrew prostitutes, because, of course, the law forbid Hebrew prostitutes. It shows that anybody could come to see the king, that's obvious, and it shows his wisdom, and it's using rather this outcast group to show that Solomon was available. Apparently, these two prostitutes uh, both became pregnant and had children very close together. Uh, they slept with their children. One apparently rolled over on her child and suffocated it in the night and yet woke up in the morning, found her dead child, and went and took the live baby from the other girl she lived with and put the dead baby there. When the other mother woke up, she started to feed her child, but even though the baby was just a few days old, she recognized it. You know how mothers are, knew every wrinkle, every little dot, every little uh, uh, thing on the baby, and she recognized it wasn't her baby. But the other mother wouldn't give it back, so that they came before Solomon. Solomon's so wise here, he said, bring me a sword. And he tells uh, the sword bearer to cut that live baby in two. Well, the real mother said, oh, no, no, don't, don't kill that baby. You give it to this other lady. Well, Solomon found out who the natural mother was by the way that mother had compassion on her child. And, of course, the, the wisdom of this kind of approach spread all over Israel and all over the ancient Near East. Why? Because here was a man they felt really was gifted by God to be fair and honest. Here was a man who would truly give justice. And this was an example of that kind of very practical wisdom. And uh, so it's, it's very famed, famous. I know in verse 28 they feared the king. Why? Because he had this gift of God, this knowing and discerning heart that God had gave uh, to him. Now in chapter 4 uh, is a brief outline of the, the administrative uh, kind of reign of Solomon. Notice we start out with these are his officials. Now there are several officials listed. The first is Azariah, the son of Zadok, was the priest. Now the priest in this part of the Old Testament usually refers to the high priest. We learn from 2 Samuel chapter 15, verses 27 and 36, and also the parallel in 1 Chronicles 6, verses 8 and 9, uh, that really Azariah was not the son of Zadok. He was the grandson of Zadok. The father's name was, um, uh, let's see, A-H-I-M-A-Z, Ahamaz. And um, apparently he had died, or for some reason he was disqualified as priest. So the word son in Hebrew it has a wide, it can mean grandson, great-great-grandson. These relative terms are very loose. So he became priest. Ahaziah became priest uh, following his grandfather Zadok. Then we have some other folks here. There were secretaries. 
Uh, some say these are Egyptian names, but I, I'm, I don't know Egyptian well enough to, uh, to know that for sure. Uh, another recorder. We're not exactly sure of these functions. Some of these have parallels in Egyptian culture, and others do not. Uh, there is this Benaiah again, and he's going to be made commander over all the, all the army. And for some reason, Zadok and Abathar are mentioned again. That's surprising, because Zadok is mentioned in two. And here we have Abathar mentioned again. Now, some say he's just quoting some old records at the first of Solomon's reign. That may be true. Others say that even though Abathar was exiled, he still had the title of priest and was included here. I think that might be true. But why is it repeated from verse 2 to verse 4? It's obviously somebody is recording some court records and using some written documents here. I think that's, that's pretty obvious. Um, now, here we have another uh, Azariah, the son of Nathan. Now, who is this Nathan? Well, it's possible it's Nathan the prophet, but probably more probable it's David's son, Nathan, uh, 2 Samuel 5.14, one of Solomon's brothers. That's who he probably is. And then we have the, the son of Nathan, a priest. Now, here again, uh, we have another Nathan, of course. I don't think it's the same one, or it could be. But uh, Notice again that this word priest. Is this the same as Zadok the priest? Well, I think not. I think the word priest, Cohen, can also mean a high court official. It's not used very often that way, and, and some of the uh, Hebrew lexicons never recognize that. But I think if you'll look in your Bible in these places, you'll see it's a real possibility. If we look at 2 Samuel chapter 8, verse 18, some of David's sons are called priests. Now, many have said, well, that's just following the idea that he's the new Jebusite king, and Canaanites can act as priest and king, but I think that's a little too elaborate. Also, we know that uh, when David's sons are mentioned, the same, the same sons are not called priests in 1 Chronicles 18:17 but called high officials. So we see that that way that it looks like that Cohen, in one sense, can mean a high court official. And also, in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 26, a non-Levite is also called a priest, which seems there is a use of this term Cohen as a high court official, and that's what I think it's functioning as in verse 5. Now, in verse 6, um, uh, we have a, a Adoram, now, this is interesting. This same name is found in the same office, and that, of course, is over the forced labor, in both David's administration, 2 Samuel chapter 20, verse 24, here in Solomon's administration, and lo and behold, even in Solomon's son, Rehoboam's administration, 1 Kings 12, 18. This guy must have really been old, I tell you, if it's the same guy or there's a junior involved. Now, this uh, idea of forced labor, originally it was just done to conquered peoples. But we learn from chapter 9, verse 15, that Solomon, because of his grandiose building programs, began to use uh, leave, uh, levies of uh, workers from the tribes. And it became a real source of tension. Matter of fact, in 922, the kingdom is going to split between Solomon's son Rehoboam and this northern Ephraimatic labor leader, one well, of the, the taskmasters of this forced labor, from Ephraim, Jeroboam I. And you might want to see the, the warning made about this uh, back when Samuel said, if you get a king, they're going to make you... Take your sons to put in their army and work for them. 1 Samuel 8, verses 12 through 17. And you might want to see that reference. Now, in verse um, 7 and following, uh, it, it goes down through about uh, verse 19, is a list of Solomon's 12 administrative districts. Now, it's interesting here that his districts do not exactly follow the tribal allocations. Now, some say he did that on purpose to weaken these tribal groups. And that may be true because he's trying to unify them. But it also seems that maybe it was because of fairness, because some of these tribal groups could not support the heavy uh, levy of food and, uh, that was necessary to support this elaborate oriental monarch and his uh, courtiers. So some say it was done to make it more fair, and some would say it was done to uh, uh, loosen these tribal ties. Anyway, you have 12 of them. Uh, it's interesting that Judah is not mentioned here. There's not one for Judah. Some say that's Solomon showing special favors to Judah. But I really think if you look at verse 19 you'll see where it says he was uh, the only deputy who was in the land. We learn this little phrase, in the land, is used in some of the un other ancient documents to refer to the land around the capital, these empires, like around Babylon, around Nineveh. So maybe since Jerusalem was very close to Judah, that refers to Judah. Now this man mentioned in verse 19, uh, some say he was the governor over the governors, or it's real possible he was a governor over the land of Judah. And uh, so I think that Judah probably really is included uh, if you look at verse 19 in that way. Uh, and it lists all these different guys and where they're from. It's interesting that in verse 11 and verse 15 is mentioned a man, uh, two men who marry Solomon's daughters. Well, that shows that we're much later in Solomon's life when this chapter is written down 
that he had daughters old enough to marry. Now, women did marry young in the ancient world. Uh, they became women at 12, and they could marry then or sometime close after that. I think even Mary was probably that young. So uh, uh, it's not, it doesn't know how many years uh, after Solomon's reign this was written, but it's obvious later. Also notice that in verse 11 we have a ben. Now the word ben means son of, and some have said there's so many son of through here that we, we, the, the original document must have lost part of the page. Well, that's possible. I'm just not sure about that. But anyway, uh, this man, uh, Abinadab, <clears throat> may have been David's brother. That's mentioned in the son of David's brother, mentioned in 1 Samuel 16, 8 and 1 Samuel 17, 13. We're just uh, not sure. But whether it was uh, David's, uh, brother's, bro David's brother's son, it's, it's going to obviously be Solomon's son-in-law. In verse 16 is another uh, son of a famous man. This Hushai may be David's famous counselor, seen in 2 Samuel chapter 15, verse 32 and 37. Um, look at verse 20. Judah and Israel were as numerous as the sand that is on the seashore. That again is a direct, a direct reference to Genesis 22:17, going back to the Abrahamic covenant that obviously God had fulfilled his promise to Abraham, brought them into the land, and their numbers were numerous. Um, let's see. And they were eating and drinking and rejoicing. And that's kind of a, a summary of the, uh, the court there. Look at verse 21. Now Solomon ruled over all the kingdom from the river... Uh, now, of course, the river, whenever you see it in the Bible, is the Euphrates River, to the land of the Philistines, to the border of Egypt, and brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Now, what we're going to have here is a, a kind of a geographical division that's uh, mentioned down here in verse 25, and 24 and 25. Uh, this is the ideal outline of the promised land that was given uh, to Abraham. Uh, this is the only time they literally fulfilled all of the promised land that was mentioned by God to Abraham, but Solomon's reign did fulfill that. Now, if you look at verse 22, it says, "In Solomon's provision for one day were 30 cores. Now, a core is pretty much equal to a homer. A really good book, I think, is Roland DeVos, The Institutes of Israel, a little paperback book that lists all of these different weights and measurements and coinages. Such a helpful thing. It comes in two volumes, Social Institutions, Religious Institutions by Roland DeVos. I hope you'll get that. It'll really help you in the Old Testament. It's extensively indexed. Uh, Josephus says that a core is 86 gallons. The rabbis say it's 44 gallons. Others say it's 100 gallons. So you can see we're just not really sure. But it shows the extravagant lifestyle of Solomon's court. I tell you that. All this, all this uh, meat and uh, flesh. And it's amazing how many donkey loads. By the way, the word core seems to mean a donkey load, uh, however that was. Again, in verse 24, we're using some names that show the, the extent of Solomon's kingdom. In verse 25, and so Judah and Israel, notice there's still this division, that there's still an administrative difference here, uh, lived in safety, and every man under his vine and fig tree. Now, this became an, even an eschatological reference, what the Messiah was going to become. It became a, a, an idiom for everything that was peace and prosperity. It's used of the last days in Micah 4.4 4 and Zechariah 3.10, uh, and and you, you might want to see that. Send of his own shade and ate the uh, fruit of his own uh, uh, thing, his own field. Now, from Dan to Beersheba, um, you noted that the Dan, the tribal allocation of Dan, moved from the Philistine area in the south and took over a Canaanite city to the north, and later it became a kind of a reference to the whole promised land, from the city of Dan in the north to the city of Beersheba in southern Judah, and that's what it's used here. Now, in verse 26, it's interesting here that in the New American Standard has, and Solomon had 40,000 stalls of horses. That seems to be so many because normally the uh, Israelites didn't use horses that much. David did in any way. Solomon seems to have imported them. But the Greek translation has 4,000 horses. And we learn from the parallel in Second Chronicles chapter 9, verse 25, has 4,000 horses. And also in Second Chronicles 1, 14, it says Solomon had 1,400 chariots. And if you got two horses per chariot and a few extras, 4,000 seems to fit. The ancient Hebrew text did thousands by putting little dots over the Hebrew letters. And so they became very notorious for being misread when the manuscript got old. So I really think it should be 4,000. And we have a manuscript problem here with the term 40,000. This continues down in verse 29, kind of a, a summary of Solomon's wisdom. Wisdom seems to be used two ways here. Solomon's wisdom, wisdom about his practical wisdom for administrating his people was well known. And that's what verse 39 is talking about. But then in verse 30 is the word wisdom used in the sense of wisdom literature. This very common literary genre found in both Egypt and Mesopotamia. And uh, Solomon is very famous for that. It says his wisdom surpassed the wisdom of all the sons of the East. 
Now, in Job 1, 3, Job is called the son of the east. We had that phrase mentioned in Job. And uh, basically, we think it's people of Arabia, Job probably from Edom, and Mesopotamia, wise men. And it mentions all of Egypt here also. And he was wiser than all the men. And then we learn that these men are listed in, in 1 Chronicles 2, 6. We know that Ethan, the Ezraite, seems to be the author of Psalms 89, and Heman, the author of Psalms 88. These other two men are also mentioned as the sons of Maol, M-A-H-O-L, uh, in this Second Chronicles 2, 6. And we're not sure if that is a man's name or the name of a guild of professional wise men. The word, the word means dancer, but in the sense of liturgical dance. Um, so I, I, I'm not sure what that is. But notice his fame in the surrounding nations. He wrote 3,000 proverbs. And so we kind of, kind of close out this. He used a lot of, uh, a lot of nature uh, things, like what animals do and trees do, and applied that to human life. And you can assert, see that in the book of Proverbs. Many of them are from Solomon. I think in this lesson, one of the most important truths is that Solomon started so well. He started as a humble man, a godly man, uh, but his life got away. Uh, starting good, being well gifted is not enough. We need to stay faithful throughout our life. And the real, le the real lesson of Solomon is that you can start with all the advantages, but if your heart gets away from the Lord, it ends in destruction. And I think we see that, uh, it's particularly in the summary of chapter 11. Well, I've enjoyed being with you, and I'll see you again, same time, same place, next week.